Hello friends, this is Sanjay. In this uh, five-part series, I have covered an overview or a quick revision of interpretation of statutes and principles of legislation as per the Karnataka State Law University, that is KSLU LLB syllabus. The syllabus is common for both the three-year and five-year LLB. In each part of the series, I will be covering one unit from the syllabus. While I have included all the topics and concepts as mentioned in the syllabus for the unit, the order or the sequence of the topics may be a little different for better explanation. This is video 5, unit 5, Principles of Legislation. The first question to be answered is, what are these principles of legislation? If you look at uh, different legal textbooks and uh, different university syllabi, some of them talk about uh, the principles of legislation in the context of why legislations are made, such as uh, Bentham's principle of uh, utility, John Rawls' principles of justice, Nozick's entitlement theory of justice, and the concepts of uh, individual interest and community interest. In uh, some other books and uh, syllabi, the principles of legislation are discussed in the context of how legislations are made, that is, the principles to be followed while making any legislation, such as uh, the principles of uh, legality, equality, proportionality, etc. Both of these categories are technically principles of legislation. In uh, one of my previous videos, I had explained the flow of how statutes are enacted, that is, how a bill becomes an act of the parliament. These are the principles that are mostly followed in the course of creation of statutes. Whereas, these are the principles that explain why legislations are made in the first place. That is, the need or the reasons for the legislation. And these principles are also followed during the actual process of enacting the statute. And uh, when we discuss these principles, you will also see that uh, these why principles have a lot of overlap with the how principles. And both of these categories are quite simple and interesting. While the topic operation of these principles upon legislation may be given separately in your syllabus, I will be talking about that aspect also when we discuss each of these principles. If you are watching this video to prepare for your LLB exams, you can choose to watch the topics which are included in your syllabus and the timestamps are in the description. If you are preparing for any competitive exams, then you should watch this video completely. When we talk about the concept of a government, we know that there are three major branches of the government, the legislature, the executive and the judiciary. We also know that uh, the legislature makes the law, the executive implements the law and in case of any disputes or ambiguity or confusion, the judiciary will interpret the law. While uh, this is a very simple understanding, when it comes to lawmaking, there is a little more that we can discuss. And uh, in a previous video, I had explained the steps through which a bill becomes an act, that is, how statutes are made. And uh, you will also remember that I explained that all statutes are laws, but all laws are not statutes. The term law includes statutes and also includes the other items that are listed in Article 13a of the Constitution, which says that law includes any ordinance, order, bylaw, rule, regulation, notification, custom or usage having in the territory of India the force of law. In other words, laws include the statutes which are made by the legislature. To implement these statutes, the executive makes some rules, regulations and orders which are also laws. And when there is a doubt, a dispute, ambiguity or a confusion regarding the law, the judiciary will interpret the law and this interpretation results in case laws. So, when we look at the big picture and the concept of lawmaking, the legislature, the executive and the judiciary, all the three branches are making laws. When we look at the subject, interpretation of statutes and the principles of legislation, the interpretation of statutes part was more focused on how the judiciary interprets the laws by applying the primary rules, the secondary rules and the presumptions. Whereas the principles of legislation part focuses on why laws are made by the legislature in the first place and the principles that influence the making of laws. Just a couple of more examples of how the judiciary and the executive influence the lawmaking process and can lead to the creation of new statutes. In 1997, while deciding on a case, the Supreme Court saw that uh, there were no comprehensive laws to deal with situations which involved harassment of women at the workplace. So, the court issued a set of guidelines which were called the Vishaka Guidelines. These guidelines not only acted as a law for a long time, they also influenced the creation of a statute, that is, the Harassment Prevention, Prohibition and Redressal Act of 2013. 
Similarly, for a long time, the process of uh, commercial taxation in India was quite complicated and uh, had started to become more and more confusing. The old system of uh, state taxes, central taxes, value-added taxes, octroi, cess, etc. had become quite cumbersome and also had many loopholes leading to revenue leakage. So the executive, which is the various departments and the ministries, started proposing the changes required to make the tax systems more suitable for the current social and economic environment of India. Over a period of time, these uh, proposals and changes got consolidated and eventually became a statute, which is the Central Goods and Services Act of 2017. So, the legislature normally does not create statutes on its own. The need for the statute is usually felt by the executive or the judiciary, who initiate the process, which is then taken forward by the legislature, leading to the creation of a statute. One of the simplest principles that explains the reason behind uh, the why and the how of the creation of laws is uh, Bentham's principle of utility. Bentham was a proponent of the philosophy of utilitarianism and the principle of utility is a fundamental concept of this philosophy. Here the term utility has a broad meaning. It can mean happiness, convenience, benefit, pleasure or it can also be anything that prevents or minimizes harm pain or unhappiness. The basic idea behind this principle is that uh, the actions or the policies of the people who make the law, that is the government, should be aimed at creating utility for the maximum number of people. Since it is uh, practically impossible to make uh, everybody happy at the same time, all the time, the actions or policies may lead to some inconvenience, pain or suffering or unhappiness to a smaller number of people. For example, the speed limit on a road may be fixed at uh, 60 km per hour. You may have a car that is uh, capable of comfortably cruising at 100 km per hour and you may be a very good driver. And you may also believe that your time is getting wasted because you are being forced to travel at a slower speed. That is, you could be traveling at 100 km per hour but you are being forced to travel only at 60 km per hour. But the reason for the speed limit is to ensure the safety and uh, therefore create utility for the maximum number of people. So, a lesser number of people who may have uh, better cars or who may be better drivers may be inconvenienced due to the lower speed. Another example that I have experienced is uh, when a street near my house was converted into a one-way. Since I had to frequently go to a shop on that street, it became an inconvenience for me because I had to go around and uh, drive almost an extra 2 kilometers to enter the street from the other side. Similarly, all the people who had offices or shops on that street were inconvenienced. But the one way created a utility for a much higher number of people who were using that street by reducing the traffic jams that used to happen on that street. John Rawls was uh, an American philosopher. He proposed a theory of justice in his uh, 1971 book. The theory of justice that he proposed is based on three underlying principles. The first one is the principle of equal liberty, which says that uh, every person has an equal right to the basic freedoms and liberties, such as freedom of speech, freedom of movement, freedom of religion, etc. But the exercise of one person's freedoms should not negatively affect another person's rights or freedoms. For example, if a person exercises his or her right to speech, then such a speech should not infringe on another person's right to privacy or right to dignity. You will notice that uh, the concept of fundamental rights in our constitution aligns with this principle. The next one is the principle of uh, fair equality of opportunity, which says that uh, every person should have equal opportunity to attain offices and positions, irrespective of their economic or social status. Now, opportunity is not just about jobs. Because jobs are often directly linked with educational qualifications, here opportunity is referring to education as well. You can see that uh, this principle also is uh, reflected in several fundamental unconstitutional rights, such as Article 16 which assures equality of opportunity in matters of public employment, Article uh, 29.1 which talks about equal opportunity of admission into educational institutions and uh, also Article 21a, which guarantees the right to education. The third principle is called the Difference Principle. 
This principle acknowledges that there will be social and economic inequalities in the society, but they should be arranged or balanced in such a way that the disadvantages are balanced to a certain extent with some advantages. For example, reservations such as uh, EWS reservations or scholarships or other facilities to disadvantaged students make an attempt that uh, some of these disadvantages are balanced by these advantages. Robert Nozick was uh, another American philosopher who also proposed a theory of justice which was in response to and uh, in some ways opposed to John Rawls theory. While uh, John Rawls theory focused on how social and economic inequalities in the society could be addressed by redistributing some of those advantages or redistributing some of the wealth through legislation, Robert Nozick gave more importance to individual rights and minimal government interference. Robert Nozick's theory also has three underlying principles. To explain how these principles work, you can imagine this scenario. Once upon a time, a fisherman went fishing in the sea and he got caught in a storm. That storm blew his boat completely off course and when the storm ended, he saw that he was near an island. When he went onto the island, he saw that it was completely uninhabited and the island had some fruit trees, there was also a source of fresh water. So the fisherman liked this place very much and he decided to stake his claim onto this island and he built a house there. Now he had become the owner of an island that previously had no owners. After living on that island for many years, he decided to sell the island and retire onto the mainland. The buyer paid the agreed price and took over the island and the house and started living there. So the previous owner, that is the fisherman, had exercised his right to sell the property and the new owner lawfully acquired it. After some time, some pirates happened to come that way. They landed on the island. They killed the new owner and took over that island. Here, the pirates had unlawfully and unjustly acquired the island from the new owner. The government got to know about what had happened on the island. So they sent uh, some navy ships to capture or kill the pirates. The navy defeated the pirates and captured that island. But uh, since the a new owner of the island had already been killed by the pirates, there were no claimants to that land. So the government decided to divide the land on that island among some poor fishermen so that they could build their houses and live there. What the government had done was to confiscate the property that had been unjustly acquired by the pirates and redistributed it within the society. If we now look at Robert Nozick's principles, when the fisherman originally acquired the island, he did so without violating anybody else's rights because the island did not have any owners. If no rights are being violated, then the government should not interfere in the exercise of individual rights and freedoms. When he sold the island to the new owner, he was exercising his right to transfer. If the buyer had cheated him, then the government should intervene to uphold justice and return the land to the fisherman. On the other hand, if the seller and the buyer are exercising their rights and the transfer is lawful, then the government should not interfere. When uh, the pirates took over the land, they committed an injustice. That is, they acquired or transferred the property unjustly. Here, the government should intervene to rectify the situation and either return the island to the rightful owners or redistribute it within the society. Nozick's view was that uh, the government and laws should have minimal role to play in people's lives and should only ensure that the acquisition and transfer of property are done in a just manner. And the government should intervene only if rectification is required. What Nozick was opposed to was redistributive justice or attempts to achieve social outcomes through legislation. For example, in India in the early 1960s, the government started passing land sealing legislations and land reforms were uh, conducted to limit land holdings and redistribute the land. This would have been against Nozick's principles because if the landowner had acquired or inherited the land lawfully, then the government was interfering in his individual rights and trying to achieve some social outcomes by making such laws. But uh, these land sealing and land reforms would align 
with John Rawls' uh, principles because the government was attempting to redistribute the land and achieve some social outcomes. Another important principle of legislation is uh, the principle of balancing between individual interest and community interest. This is not a principle that is attributed to any single philosopher or legal theorist. This is a principle that has evolved from the discussions around the nature of justice, governance and from social contract theories. Now, what are these individual interests? Well, these are individual rights and freedoms such as privacy, speech, movement, property rights, etc. What are community interests? These are aspects that are important for the community or the country as a whole such as uh, social welfare, national security and the common goods such as public health. This principle says that uh, when the legislature is making laws, they should balance between individual interests and community interests. In some situations, individual freedoms may take precedence. In uh, many other situations, community interests may take precedence where individuals have to sacrifice their uh, personal rights or interests for the greater good of the society. A good example of this is the right to own firearms. Countries which uh, prioritize individual interests typically allow a greater degree of freedom to own firearms. In many places in the United States, you can just walk into a shop and buy. On the other hand, countries like India, which prioritize community interests, typically place significant restrictions because the idea is that indiscriminate uh, permissions can lead to an increased level of uh, danger in the society as a whole. So, there are severe restrictions on owning firearms. As I mentioned, this principle of uh, balancing between individual interest and community interests evolved from several theories. The first one is the theory of social contract, which was supported by philosophers like uh, Thomas Hobbes or uh, John Locke. This theory of uh, social contract says that when people are a part of a society, such as a country or a state, then there is a social contract whereby people surrender some of their individual freedoms for the benefits that they are getting by living in a society. Then there is uh, the theory of uh, utilitarianism, which includes Bentham's principle of utility, which says that while making laws, the greater utility of the greater number of people should be considered which may result in the rights of a smaller number of people being sacrificed. And then there are uh, concepts like uh, liberalism or uh, communitarianism. While liberals give more importance to individual rights, communitarians give more importance to community values and benefits. And uh, the lawmakers have to balance between these two viewpoints. I hope uh, this concept of individual interest and community interest is clear. If you have any questions, please post a comment. When you have some time, just google about the lost and found system in Japan and you will find some fascinating facts and statistics. A study that was done by the University of Michigan apparently showed that while only about 10% of the lost wallets are eventually recovered by their owners in New York, up to 80% are recovered by the people in Japan. I did some rough calculations that if 100 wallets are lost, around 7 would have been unrecoverable or destroyed around 8 are still lying under a bench or in the grass or stuck somewhere and not yet recovered. So, of the 100 lost wallets, perhaps only 85 were actually recovered and of these 80 were returned. This is the 80% that the study has arrived at. If 80 were returned out of the 85, then that would mean that 94% of the people in Japan are very honest. Why is this so? It is not because of uh, some special laws in Japan. Their laws about lost property are similar to many other countries. This honesty is also not because of any reward or recognitions. It is only because uh, people in Japan are taught right from the time they are kids that it is not okay to keep anything that is not yours. Especially if you know that it has been lost by someone else. Apparently, even small children are taught to go to the lost and found office and return even small denomination coins that they find anywhere. What is driving people's behavior is their own moral values, their own sense of right and wrong that they learned from their society. So morals are not formally written anywhere. And usually there is no punishment if you choose to do something that is not morally right. Laws on the other hand are written rules and regulations and often they have a penalty or a punishment for non-compliance. You follow morals because you want to. 
you follow the law because you have to moral behavior is driven from inside and compliance with laws is driven from outside so these are the differences between morals and legislations and if the government wants to strictly enforce a moral behavior then they should enact a legislation to do so before we move on quickly read through this table comparing the key differences between morals and laws morals are internal they are based on individual values and beliefs laws are external these are written rules enacted by the government morals are focused on the concept of right and wrong and they may be influenced by factors like uh, culture religion etc because what is morally wrong in one culture may be acceptable in other cultures on the other hand laws focus on preventing harm promoting uh, justice and fairness and maintaining order in the society there is no formal enforcement of morals whereas laws are enforced through fines and punishments morals are broad principles and guidelines that cover behavior whereas laws are clear rules that cover specific actions morals are subjective since they can differ between individuals whereas laws are objective because they apply equally on every person in the jurisdiction morals may change organically without any formal record whereas laws change only by way of amendments or through new legislations so there are formal records on when how and why laws were changed morals are like uh, always telling the truth always keeping promises and laws cover aspects like not stealing not harming others and respecting contracts laws are usually made based on the prevailing morals of the society at that time for example when the society realized that uh, child marriage is morally wrong then laws were passed to make it a crime morals are often extended above the law and individuals may choose to have personal ethical standards or moral standards that go beyond what is a legal requirement for example when the country was under lockdown and the law required businesses to continue paying salaries to their full time employees some businesses decided to pay even casual and contract staff also so they went above and beyond what was required by the law just because they felt it was morally right even though it was not a legal requirement so that is the difference between morals and laws till now we looked at the principles of legislation that covered why laws are made now let us look at the principles that are connected with how laws should be made these are also very simple and easy to understand for example the first principle is the principle of legality which means that the laws themselves should be legal for example the constitution grants some powers to the government and also sets some limits which means that the laws should not exceed those powers and must be within the limits set by the constitution equality which means that uh, the laws should apply equally to all citizens without uh, discrimination on any grounds such as uh, race gender religion or social status proportionality which means that uh, the consequences of uh, contravening or breaking any laws should be proportional to the severity of the offense very severe punishments for uh, small offenses or for offenses committed uh, unintentionally are not proportional public good which means that the legislation should aim to promote public interest welfare and security while balancing individual rights with the collective good of the society separation of powers this principle ensures that uh, the legislative the executive and the judicial powers are distinct and separate and provide a level of checks and balances on each other to prevent abuse of power by any one branch transparency and accountability which means that the process of making laws should be open and transparent and the lawmakers themselves should be accountable to the public for their own actions and decisions principle of a due process which means that the laws must guarantee a proper process and fair procedures for determining rights such as the right to a fair trial the right to be heard the right to appeal clarity and predictability which means that uh, the laws should be written clearly and precisely so that people can understand their rights and obligations this uh, predictability allows individuals and businesses to plan their actions accordingly and any ambiguity or doubts in the laws should be interpreted in favor of the accused or in favor of the defendant human rights protection 
which means that uh, the legislation should protect and promote human rights ensuring that uh, the laws do not infringe on the fundamental freedoms and rights which are recognized by national and international law and uh, participation which means that the process of law making should allow for the participation of those affected by the laws which means that the process of uh, law making should allow for the participation by the citizens and it should also provide avenues for public input and feedback you will see that all of these principles are common sense and many of these principles such as uh, legality equality separation of powers due process human rights protection are built into the supreme rule book of the country itself that is they are built into the constitution with that we will end this video if you have any questions or feedback post a comment below and uh, i will see you soon in the next video take care and jai hind